And, you know, we used to use this uh, method of navigation. There's known as dog barking. At night, you came in towards the coast until the uh, you could hear the dogs bark and then put back out to sea again. Such was the media and public interest in those early races that its future was assured. The headlines left no doubt it would continue as an annual event. For the people of Sydney, the start of the race each Boxing Day had become a sporting ritual. Tens of thousands packed onto spectator craft and lined the shores to farewell the death-defying sporting heroes and their small yachts. The reception in Hobart where the Royal Yacht Club of Tasmania was the host club, was equally enthusiastic. The dawning of the second half of this century saw the Sydney Hobart Classic six years old and 16 yachts lining up for the start. Over the next 10 years, the race began setting safety and communication standards, which would be recognised as the best in the world. As early as 1951, communications were such that the yacht Karawa escorted the fleet in the role of mothership. Unfortunately, she had to abandon her duties off St Helens on Tasmania's northeast coast when owner Frank Livingston fell ill. He had to put ashore in a small boat for hospital treatment. The first film story of the race also came in 1951. It's a festival of sunshine and water as the starter's gun sends 14 ocean yachts racing down Sydney Harbour, hell-bent for Hobart, Tasmania, 640 miles away as the Seahawk flies. It's also history in the making. For when the race is over, three of the yachts will have broken the record for the long and arduous course. The foreshores are crammed with spectators. Many here couldn't tell a rudder from a boom, but even the landlubber gets a kick out of the start of the big ocean race. First to clear Sydney heads is Struan Marie, 35 feet long and carrying a crew of six. This is her first long race, but experts like her chances. Skipper Tom Williamson has reason to look pleased. Most ocean races are lightly built nowadays. It doesn't take much wind to keep them moving at a good pace. The crews welcome the easy going, which gives them a chance to relax in the sunshine, listening to the chuckle of rushing water against the hull. Someone remembers a good joke and shares it with his mates. Someone else caps it with another. What if the jokes do get a bit blue at times? There are no ladies present, and a salty yarn is at its best when told in the salty freedom of the cockpit. At nightfall, the leaders are 100 miles south of Sydney, and the yacht's position are broadcast to the mainland from the radio room of the mothership Karawa. Karawa calling Sydney radio, Karawa calling Sydney radio, and 2SM. Come in, Sydney. Over. Come in, Karawa. Come in, Karawa. Come in, Karawa. And this is the position of the yachts at 8 p.m. As they get out towards the 100 fathom line, Lass of Lass got his finger up very smartly and has taken the lead from Fortuna. Just behind Fortuna is Margaret Rintoul. Morning brings little wind, but this calm is deceptive, and weather forecasts warn of an approaching storm. Wind at last shouts the skipper to his crew. Brother, you'll be sorry. Hang on to that tiller, skipper. Bass Strait is no place to be caught with your mast down. The 40 knot southwesterly gale is putting too much strain on Wayfarer's big mainsail. So down it comes, and the crew tuck in a reef to reduce its area. The yachts are really getting a drubbing now. Remember that old saying, those who go to sea for pleasure would go to hell for a pastime? Well, this is how it was born. The crew of the schooner Irene find time to toss a fishing line overboard. A voracious barracuda takes the bait and is hauled on deck to be added to the larder. Meanwhile, there is feverish activity at St Helens, a small port of northeast Tasmania. And so an aircraft piloted by Aero Club instructor Lloyd Jones flies out to search for the yachts. Flying over St Helens now. Here are the racing yachts. First one I can see is uh, Solvi. The schooner Pavana is in front of her, and further out to sea is a yacht that looks like uh, Lahara. Yes, it is Lahara. Rasselas racing along, followed by Strew and Murray standing closer in. By evening, most of the yachts have reached the Tasmanian coast. It's still anybody's race, and the helmsmen grow tense as they manoeuvre their craft to get every available ounce of wind into the sails. 
Hobart is only a few miles away on the fifth morning of the race, and the men perform all tasks at the double, taking turns to eat their breakfast. At 5 a.m., the leaders are passing Cape Rao, and Lloyd Jones flies out to report Margaret their position. Rintoul in the distance, entering the Derwent River. Flying over Strew and Marie now, there are other yachts all around her. There's Lassa Lass, and close astern, Fortuna moving well. News of Margaret Rintoul's arrival has reached Hobart, and the big crowd gathers to cheer her in. Bang goes the judge's gun, and Margaret Rintoul is not only first home, but has also clipped an hour and a half off the course record. While the yawl's sails are dropped and furled, watchers report two cutters coming in. The first turns out to be Lassa Lass. The second one is Struan Marie. She is third across the line, also beating the old course record, and she looks like winning the cup. Not bad for a 35-footer sailing her first big race. By late afternoon, all doubts are dispelled. Struan Marie is acclaimed the winner, and the crews get together to discuss the race and the celebrations that await them. For this is New Year's Eve, and Hobart Town is famed for its hospitality. Aboard Struan Marie, the little cabin is filled to overflowing as guests crowd in to toast the winners and join them in a rousing chorus of sea shanties. Now that the race is over, you may wonder what it's all about. What is the price which these ocean wallopers so willingly face the hardships and perils of the open sea? Well, here it is, the George Adams Silver Cup, one of yachting's richest trophies. But the cup is only a symbol. The real prize is adventure and a chance to test one's fighting spirit against that of other men who love the sea. The Tasmanian Government Film Unit's award-winning production, Hard to Windward, was distributed overseas and played a major role in attracting international entries to future Sydney Hobart events. And their ration of rum. The city, too, waking abruptly from its Christmas sleep, pours forth eager crowds and spills them round the shores. There's an air of excitement about this festive Boxing Day as they wait for the yachts to move out onto the harbour. Sweethearts and families may not see their men back in port for several weeks. It can be an anxious wait. Like a skimming gull, an aircraft drops low to spy on the ferries circling the edge. Reaching across the water, out of the wooded shores, the spectators come in their steamers, workboats and little tin tubs to mingle in mid-morning sunlight with the strong, sleek hulls of the ocean racers. Landlubbers gaze from shore with long eyes, watching competing yachts and spectator craft cross and recross and merge together, until someone misjudges. Ripe seafaring language gives way to anxious thoughts, but help is near and there's no stopping. The gun is only seconds away, and all eyes converge on the starting line. Five seconds to go, Four, three, two, one. And over the line, tall ships and small ships all in together. Schooners and catchers and cutters and sloops, they slide seaward in a flow of white canvas. South head to starboard and Sydney astern, the tall ships emerge in scattered file for their first taste of what is to come. They sail through brief sunshine when eating on deck is a rich delight and when a tune at dusk is a companionable thing and passes the time away. How about Radio to Karawa? Roger, your position. Here's a gale warning. A deep depression centred 100 miles south of Hobart causing strong to gale force winds over southern waters. that sends a shiver down every man's back. With the ship luffed up to the wind and the boom sheeted hard in, all hands make speed to shorten sail and tuck in a good strong reef. One by one, the ocean and storm day give up their ships as they pass by the iron pot light into the river Derwent and into the sight of the man on watch. And come at last to the quiet waters of the harbour 
where the city of Hobart, spread under the foothills of Mount Wellington, waits, ready to acclaim the first across the line. It's the end of a long, hard slog, and of Victoria's one. But for the men who sail in the Sydney Hobart yacht race, winning is not so important. It's the comradeship, an affinity with sea and wind, and some quality that draws them out to pit their skill and lives against the forces of nature. A quality that seems common to all men who challenge the sea in ships. Come 1957, and it was then mandatory for every yacht to carry a two-way radio and report its position. During the same period, there was a progressive introduction of new safety standards, including the carrying of life jackets and the fitting of a safety fence, or lifelines, around the perimeter of the deck. Some of the names now seen as being synonymous with the development of ocean racing in Australia were also emerging in this era. There were the Halverson brothers, who, after missing the victory of their yacht Solvig due to illness in 1954, tasted their first race success in 1957 with an Etra 5. Two other brothers, Frank and John Livingston, were forever prominent with their big line honours boat Karua 4, and the famous Vic Meyer solo combination also emerged. Modern day sailors often look back on this era with an element of awe impressed by the grit of the sailors of yesteryear who had nothing like the sails, equipment, navigational aids or clothing we take for granted when racing today. Throughout the history of this race, masses of spectators have turned Sydney Harbour into one enormous natural amphitheatre for the start each Boxing Day. There has always been a wonderful carnival atmosphere prevailing as cheering crowds crammed aboard craft large and small salute the adventurous sailors. On shore, every vantage point is packed with enthusiastic fans. It has grown to a situation today where around 300,000 people farewell the fleet each year, making it one of Australia's biggest sporting spectacles. At the same time, a huge national and international television audience follows the race from the comfort of home. Much to the delight of competing sailors, the people of Hobart still generate an equally impressive welcome when the yachts arrive at the finish line, right at the edge of the city. Like Sydney, Hobart's enthusiasm for the race was also there from the outset. Back in 1945, 5,000 people were out at 5 a.m. to welcome Captain Illingworth and Rani. To this day, no matter the hour, thousands upon thousands of enthusiastic race followers line the Derwent River and the docks to welcome the heroes of Hobart. It has become a tradition and it extends even to the smallest yachts. For the competitors, Hobart is a welcome haven after their incessant battle with the elements over the preceding days. Race weary as they might be though, they always have the energy to celebrate their arrival in Hobart. For some fortunate crews, there has always been a post-Hobart race bonus, the cruise home along Tasmania's beautiful east coast where some of the most picturesque parts of Australia are to be found. It was inevitable the word of the Sydney Hobart Classic would spread internationally, but it wasn't until 1962 that it really hit the world stage. That was when the young New York shipping millionaire Huey Long arrived in Sydney with his stunning looking and highly successful offshore racer Ondine. The locals thought this lightweight aluminium yacht wouldn't cope with the tough demands of the Hobart race and for the majority of the 630 nautical miles it appeared that way. The big schooner Asta led approaching the Derwent, a grandstand finish followed. The finish up the Derwent has spectators on their toes as Ondine leads Astor by less than one minute.
Ondine beats Astor by one minute. Solo finished 45 minutes later. The other yachts are becalmed and fog-bound off Tasman Light. While Ondine secured line honours and lowered the 11-year-old course record time to just under three days and four hours, Vic Meyer's solo saved the day for Australia, carrying the colours to victory on handicap and winning the major trophy, the Tattersalls Cup. Astor was more fortunate the following two years, taking line honours in both races. But her effort then was completely overshadowed by the Halverson brothers and their amazing yacht Freya. She won in 63, 64 and 65, only the second yacht in the history of world offshore racing to achieve such a feat. The 60s also saw the Kiwis come onto the scene. It started in 1966 when the sleek and slippery sloop for Dallas dumbfounded everyone, except its crew, and took line honours. One year later, when the Southern Cross Cup International Team Series was created in conjunction with the Hobart race, the Kiwis completed the job when Chris Buzade's Rainbow 2 won the race. The international flavour of the race was confirmed over the next two years. In 1968, the year we saw the first colour film race report, there were 13 overseas yachts competing. However, it was one yacht Huey Long's spanking new Ondine 2 that held all the interest in the lead-up. The big blue boat was dismasted in the Indian Ocean en route to Sydney and appeared certain to miss the race. But a determined Long stunned everyone by air freighting a huge new aluminium section in from Germany and stepping it only hours before the start. Ondine 2 not only made the start, she cleared out and took line honours. The historic 25th Sydney Hobart race in 1969 was laden with interest. The British were out in strength, including future Prime Minister Edward Heath with his yacht Morning Cloud. Countryman Sir Max Aitken was also present with his big boat Crusade. There was also the exciting new Australian yacht Apollo, designed by Bob Miller, the man who would, in later years, adopt the name Ben Lexan and create the America's Cup winner, Australia 2. Sid Fisher, today an ocean racing legend, was the emerging local star and race favourite that year with his magnificent new yacht, Ragamuffin. And on top of all that, there was a record fleet of 79. Ironically, just like the first race, it was a British benefit. Crusade collected the Line Honours Trophy while Ted Heath's overall win delivered the ultimate prize and gave him a rocket-like ride up the popularity poles back home. Heath, now Sir Edward, is just one of many famous people who have been part of the history of the Hobart race. That list also includes media men like Rupert Murdoch with his yacht Eilina and America's Ted Turner, who took line and handicap honours with American Eagle in 1972. America's Cup winner Alan Bond began his long association with the race in 1969 with Apollo and ended with the Big Maxi drumbeat in 1989. The race has also seen some very memorable moments, none more so than the 1982 and 83 finishes. In 1982, Apollo entered the Derwent River, just 11 nautical miles from the finish, with a 1.5 nautical mile advantage over Bob Bell's Maxi Condor of Bermuda. The greatest finish ever was to follow, as this report reveals. With three kilometres to go, Apollo had drawn level but could not break through the wind shadow created by Condor's towering mast. Both crews worked frantically to catch every breath of the light sea breeze. Meanwhile, the wind was filling in from behind and Helsel 2, Vengeance and Rampant 2 were all in the river and gaining on the leaders. With just 100 metres to go, the wind changed direction and Condor Spinnaker wrapped around her rigging. Apollo crept up alongside and it appeared certain she would take the lead. But the wind changed yet again and Condor's crew made desperate moves to stay ahead. It worked. There's the gun and the sirens and the hooters. And from the reaction of the Condor crew, they've won it by a canvas, the narrowest margin possible.